what is creativity? In my point of view, there are two types of creativity, applied and pure. Applied creativity is this. Some external source poses a problem and some problem solver tries to solve it by creatively generating all kinds of solution candidates until the problem is solved. Humans and machines have been doing this for a long time, for example in chess or in Go or in many other applications. Pure creativity is when the problem solver does not slavishly try to solve problems posed by others, but also invents its own problems. That's what babies do when they play with their toys. They invent their own questions. What will happen if I do this? Science is about asking questions, not only answering questions, but also asking questions. And the baby asks, what will happen if I do this? If I let this toy fall to the ground? And that's also what scientists do when they set up their experiments to figure out how the world works. They are trying to answer self-posed questions. And this also applies to artists and musicians. For three decades we have built machines that invent and solve their own self-posed problems, that invent their own questions and try to answer them. Once the answer is known, the subject becomes boring and the machine tries to invent a new question whose answer is not yet known. And over time it learns to ask better questions and find better answers. Many humans feel that certain machines already have a strong form of applied creativity. For example, Go players coming up with creative winning moves that no human ever thought of. And some people also perceive creativity in artificial neural networks that have learned to draw novel drawings in um, the style of certain famous artists. In 1990 I introduced a new type of active unsupervised or self-supervised learning with intrinsic motivation. It is based on a minimax game where one neural network tries to minimize the objective function maximized by the other neural network. Today I refer to this duel between two unsupervised adversarial neural networks as adversarial artificial curiosity. So how does adversarial artificial curiosity work? There is a controller neural network which probabilistically generates output actions that may influence an environment. And there is the world model neural network that learns to predict the environmental reactions to the outputs of the controller. So it learns to predict the consequences of the actions of the controller. The world model learns to minimize its error, so the deviations between what it predicts and what really happens, and in this way it is becoming a better predictor. But in a zero-sum game, the controller tries to find output actions that maximize the error of the world model, whose loss is the gain of the controller. Hence, the controller is motivated to invent novel outputs or experiments, action sequences, that yield data from the environment that the world model still finds surprising until the data becomes uh, known and, and boring. Yes, they keep fighting and in the process both of them get smarter. So the world model neural network learns to improve its answers to the questions invented by the creative controller. So we have artificial curiosity and creativity in this very, very simple system.
at the moment, humans still have more compute and cheaper compute. But every five years, computers are getting roughly 10 times faster per dollar. Today, hardware is roughly a million billion times faster per dollar. We have greatly profited from this acceleration. Soon, we will have uh, cheap computers with the raw computational power of a human brain. And a few decades after that, if that trend doesn't break, uh, we will have cheap computers with the raw computational power of all 10 billion human brains taken together. And, um, and AIs, in this way, will become much more creative than humans are. The previously mentioned adversarial creative system of 1990 was actually just the beginning. Since then, we have produced more sophisticated artificial curiosity systems. And a central idea of these uh, subsequent systems was the concept of compression progress. And all of science is about finding simpler, shorter descriptions of the data and that's what Newton did and what Kepler did, because general relativity theory was able to predict away the uh, deviations from the old uh, predictions, from the old theory of gravity. Suddenly there was a new, more elegant, simpler theory of gravity, which allowed to very compactly encode many more additional observations. What is simple and elegant in the eyes of one observer may not be simple and elegant in the eyes of another observer that has less prior knowledge, which first needs to be educated to understand the simplicity of the observations, to understand the short roles behind the observational data. And learning here means compression progress. But my formal theory of curiosity and creativity takes into account this subjectivity of the observers. And given this particular uh, observer, some things are easy to understand and uh, elegant and beautiful and simple. And um, other things are not yet, but they, became, they can become so through learning. And uh, this theory of artificial curiosity and creativity really the, has this learning as a fundamental ingredient and we can measure this learning progress and we say this learning progress is the extra intrinsic reward or the fun. Compression progress not only motivates the scientists but also the artists. Artists? and the observers of art get also rewarded for making and observing novel patterns. Data that is neither arbitrary nor regular in an already known way, but regular in a way that's new with respect to the subjective observer's current knowledge, yet learnable. That is, after learning, fewer computational resources are needed to encode the data. The theory even explains humor. Consider the following sentence. Biological organisms are driven by the four big F's. Feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating. Some subjective observers who hear this for the first time think, it's funny. Why? As one is perceiving the text, the brain receives a complex input stream. Once you get it, you need only so many bits to store the story. And the difference between before and after, that's the fun that you have.